Welcome to 2819. This is the show where we aim to inspire you to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm Sandra Dimez. And I'm Krista Bontrager. And this is the television outreach of Reasons to Believe, a viewer-supported ministry where science and faith converge. And, you know, we really hope that as you're watching today, you'll look at the episodes with sharing the gospel in mind. So we hope that they'll encourage you to reach out to people you know. And as you're watching the show today, be sure to get connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show. But first, we're going to kick things off with a quick rundown of what we're up to today. In our Give and Take segment, Jeff is going to talk with theologian Ken Keithley and Fazal Rana about an important question. Why does it matter if the Bible is accurate in matters of science and history? Very good question. Very mm -hmm. important question. And in our Culture Talk segment, Sandra and Fuzz are going to be talking about something called the Cultural Big Bang and what that means for how Christians might view the arts. Mm -hmm. Love that conversation. I'm excited for it. Then in our Nexus segment, our friend Sean McDowell shares a real-life example of how to stop being defensive and instead truly love the atheists in your life. Such a great way to understand how we engage with atheists. I love Sean's advice. Yes. So be sure to catch that segment. And Monica will be talking with Jeff about RTB's youth mentoring program. If you know a future scientist in your life, a future doctor or mathematician, physicist, we have a mentoring program called The Lab that we want to get your, the student in your life connected with. So Monica and Jeff are going to talk about that. But first, in RTB 101, Krista, you're going to be talking with Hugh Ross about a great question that someone might be wondering, what can churches do to be more welcoming to scientists? Ah, at last, a great question. How let's can we get that welcome mat out there for the yes. scientists? Yes. <laughs> so let's take a look. And now it's time for RTB 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help equip you to share your faith with your friends and family more effectively. And I'm here today with Dr. Hugh Ross. And you know, Hugh, I, well, one thing I like to say is that reasons to believe we are missionaries to scientifically minded people. But I also know that scientists and scientifically minded people don't always feel like the welcome mat is out for them at their local church. And I really can't imagine a better person to talk to than you about this question because you have been reaching out to scientists for four decades. So help me understand, what are we doing that are turning them away? Well, you're talking about overt science-minded people. I argue that everybody is science-minded. Okay. We're all interested in nature, but a lot of people are kind of shy away from it. But there's the people who are overt about it. I need to understand this, so please help me. Okay. And what churches need to do is understand these people are questioners, they're challengers, they really want to know, and they don't want just a superficial answer. And they especially want an opportunity to engage in research. So a sermon where you say goodbye to everybody probably isn't going to work for them. They need an opportunity where they can actually dialogue with like-minded people, uh, with spiritual leaders. And uh, don't be afraid if they challenge you. That's typically how they learn. You know, prove it to me. I mean, I had a lab partner. Every time I said something, he says, I won't believe it till you prove it to me. And he says, convince me. Now, he wanted me to convince him. But he was, again, just said, you've got to prove every single point. I'll understand this. Mainly because they don't want to share something unless they really have the confidence that it's true. So it sounds like maybe local churches often are doing things that are very kind of a subtle turn off to people that are overtly scientifically minded. Maybe we don't give them a place to ask questions. Uh, we don't give them a place to discuss the sermon. Right. We don't have people available to answer questions in a substantive way. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, and often churches think, well, we do give ch chances for questions, but it's way too brief and way too much on a su superficial level. Okay. These are people who want maybe a 15-minute message and two hours of questions and dialogue, and most churches aren't set up for that. Okay. So if we're going to reach people in our community that are overtly scientifically minded, people who like to ask the tougher questions, we as Christians have to, it sounds like, have a little fortitude in our souls to be able to receive those questions and to take them seriously. And to be patient, actually give the time. 
Notice in the book of Acts, you've got Paul sometimes engaging skeptics all night long. He took the time to deal with their questions and issues. You're not going to be able to take care of it in just 20 minutes. How long in your experience does it take for somebody who's more scientifically minded to come to faith in Christ? Is that a long journey for most people? Well, if they haven't been raised in a Christian home, I've never seen one come to faith in Christ in less than 18 months. And for those who do come to faith that fast, it's because they've been intently studying throughout that 18 month period. It can sometimes take uh, several years. So what are some two or three just very practical ideas if we have any pastors watching the show right now that they could do to start to implement a culture in their church to help put out the welcome mat for these scientifically minded people? Well, launching some adult classes that are not sermon oriented, but dialogue and debate oriented, that's a good way to go. Very good. Do you have any other tips for, for those pastors? Well, make sure that these groups are not too big and not too small. If they're too small, uh, these unbelieving skeptics can't hide and just observe. And if they're too big, they're not going to be able to participate, raise their hand and challenge and ask questions. Mid-sized groups are very effective. Very good. Dr. Hugh Ross, everyone, I want to encourage you to get connected with Hugh on social media because you can get regular updates about new reasons to believe in the God of the Bible. Next up in our Nexus segment today, we have a great clip from our 2017 AMP conference. Our friend Sean McDowell offers some very practical advice about how we can love the atheists in our life better. Let's take a look at that. Some time ago in the summer, I was at this, at this camp and probably four or 500 students, I taught all week, probably 10 or 12 times. And I kicked it off doing my atheist encounter. And this group of students were testy, they were defensive, they were angry. And finally, this girl in the back middle stands up. She goes, Mr., I just want to read you something. I said, okay, what do you want to read me? She said, it's from the Bible, the Holy Word of God. I said, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the Bible. She goes, I don't care, listen up. <laughs> I said, all right. She reads to me Psalms 14.1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. I said, so you're publicly calling me a fool. She goes, yep, you're a fool. Her friends like stand up, they're like clapping, giving each other a five, they're like, got you fool, and pointing at me. Well, they sit down and afterwards, whenever I do that, I kind of get surrounded by students because I've made them think and I've stirred them up and they're not quite sure how to answer these questions. And this girl waited till everybody was gone and she was gonna be a junior, so she must've been about 16, 17 years old. She came up to me and she kind of looked like this sheepishly and said, I wanna thank you for doing your best to defend atheism. I said, sure, why are you thanking me? She goes, well, I'm an atheist. I said, really, you're at a Christian camp? Tell me your story, how'd you end up here? She goes, well, I am a leader in my youth group. I said, I feel like just maybe I'm missing something. She said, I've grown up in the church and recently I had some questions about God, about the Bible, other religions. My pastor said, just have faith. My youth pastor couldn't answer him. My parents couldn't answer him. I finally realized I don't believe anymore. I said, well, have you told anyone? She said, no, you're the first person. I said, why haven't you told anyone? She said, because I'm afraid they'll treat me like they just treated you. Friends, I wish you could be like a fly on the wall when I've done this around the country. Recently I did and someone came up to me and they're like, seeing the responses of Christians isn't this discouraging to you? I said, no, because I think most Christians are eager to do the right thing. And I think that one reason, I wrote a whole blog on this, sometimes we Christians get easily offended. Why? I think it's because we don't know what we believe. If we really know what we believe and someone challenges us, we're not threatened. But if we don't know, that's when we get defensive. So whenever I'm done doing this role play, the first thing I ask the audience is not how do we answer these questions. I always try to catch them off guard and I say, I'm, I'm curious, how did you treat me? And I wish you could be on stage and see the response. People's eyes always go like, oh shoot. <laughs> and I'll say, give me individual words that describe how you teach, how I treat, you treated me. It's like defensive. We treat you, usually someone will say hostile. And recently, a girl, a high school girl, she said, insignificant. I said, that's an interesting word. What do you mean? She said, we were so worried about proving you wrong. We didn't even listen and value your opinions, which ultimately says 
that you're insignificant. Friends, I don't think we do evangelism and apologetics and conversations that well today. One reason is because we go to apologetic conferences. Get our ammo, get our arguments, because I'm going to go win. Well, I hope that's not your attitude here. That is certainly not RTB's goal. This is to honor God, build up the strength of Christians, and love non That's why we're here. If you want to check out Sean McDowell's full talk, visit Reasons.org YouTube channel and click on the AMP playlist. Now it's time for Culture Talk. In this segment, we talk about culturally relevant topics, including books and films and things you're going to encounter in everyday conversations. So I have today as my guest, Dr. Fazal Rana. Thank you for joining me. Sandra. I'm very excited because we're going to talk about something that's near and dear to our heart, and that is art. Um, we love art. So first, we're going to get to the science stuff. Um, now, we're, of course, familiar with the Big Bang Theory as a cosmological model, but something that people might not be familiar with is something called the Cultural Big Bang. So can you explain to us what that is? Yeah, well, this is something that's really fascinating, that when we look at the archaeological record, we see that when modern humans appear on Earth, there's an explosive appearance of sophisticated behavior that seems to show up virtually out of nowhere. And that behavior includes our artistic expression, musical expression, religious expression, the production of jewelry. Suddenly, we have human beings cre creating things artistically that have no survival value, and it seems to be a compulsion that human beings have, the very first human beings have. So you said that it has no survival benefit. So it sounds then like from an evolutionary perspective, it's a little bit difficult to explain that, but it fits nicely with the Christian model. Yeah, well, you could look at this as being a manifestation of, of the image of God. Mm -hmm. The capacity to make art and music, uh, body ornamentation, uh, reflects a capacity called symbolism, where we as human beings are capable of representing the world symbolically and I see this as uh, consistent with the idea that humans are uniquely made in God's image. This is a, a piece of science that supports that notion. So then when we create, we are emulating the creator is kind of what we're saying here, right? That, that's exactly right. And, and so, yeah, when we, we create, we are functioning like many creators. And mm -hmm. this is really rather profound. Yeah, no, it's definitely encouraging as an artist myself and uh, for the two of us, I know we like to engage in different types of art forms. Oftentimes, though, in Christian conversations, it seems like if you're not in a worship band, if you can't sing and play an instrument, that you can't really bring glory to God through your art. So what would you offer as encouragement for our photographers, dancers, writers, other artists who want to use that art to bring glory to God? Well, you know, my view on art, particularly art produced by non-Christian artists, radically changed when I wrote the book, Who Was Adam? And I started to appreciate the fact that what was defining human beings was this capacity for artistic and musical expression. And so I realized that even when non-Christians are expressing themselves artistically, they are unwittingly bringing glory to God because they're manifesting the image of God. Well, how much more so for Christians who are artists or, or musicians or uh, who like to dance? Right. That creativity is glorifying God because only human beings can do that, and it flows out of the fact that we are creators who bear God's image uh, just like our creator. Beautiful. So then when we think about um, just engaging in certain types of art, I know when I first became a Christian, things seemed a little bit scary. Anything that wasn't overtly Christian was kind of scary, and I wasn't sure if it was okay for me to... Um, engage in it or enjoy it. So how about for you? Was that kind of your experience? Same thing. I sold all of my rock albums oh. when I became a, a Christian to the, uh, you know, to the local record store. Uh, but again, over time, as I grew uh, in my maturity as a Christian, I'm able to handle the art and the music produced by non-Christians because I have, uh, again, a sophistication about thinking about that work and I think about it redemptively. But I would caution somebody if you are Young in the faith, you may not want to just delve into non-Christian work uh, until you have a, a maturity level or you're in conversation with a, a, a Christian who is mature. So maybe just having some discernment and yeah. being cautious. But, you know, if we're comfortable, then um, yeah. we can actually find some beauty and um, 
see God's kind of image through other art forms. And if we can appreciate the art that non-Christians make, it's a wonderful bridge mm -hmm. uh, to the gospel. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for that, Fuzz. If you want to hear more from Dr. Fuzz Rana, visit reasons.org and check out The Cell's Design, which is his blog. You can also find his book, Who Was Adam? Now we're going to go over to Jeff and see what the scholars are up to. Hello, Jeff Zwarink here, and welcome again to Give and Take, where we discuss the latest scientific issues to help you be more confident in sharing Christ with others. Today, I'm joined by Ken Keithley and Fuzz Rana, and we're going to look at the issue of inerrancy and why is it important in the science faith discussions. Ken, Fuzz, good to have you here today. Good yeah. to be here. So let's just start off, get right into it. What is inerrancy? Let's, let's have some common ground there. What are we talking about? Inerrancy simply means that the Bible, since it is the Word of God, and God is truth, and His Word is truth, the Bible is always telling us the truth in all that it affirms. So is that saying that the Bible is going to tell us all truth, or is it something a little different than that? It's certainly not exhaustive truth. I, I can't find any verse that says 2 plus 2 equals 4, but I know that's true. No, it, when we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture, we're, telling, it's, we're saying that all of the revealed divine truth that we need is in the Bible. But when it speaks about something related to history or something that could be potentially a scientific concept, Inerrancy would demand that those concepts, when properly interpreted, those passages, when properly interpreted, would correspond with what we know to be true about reality. Yes, God is telling us the truth. That's the idea. So, yes. so it sounds like it's just kind of the idea that whatever the Bible speaks to, it speaks correctly and authoritatively. Yes, in a nutshell, truth without any mixture of error. Okay. So does that mean that my New American Standard Version is inerrant? In a word, yes. Okay. To the extent that it faithfully is translated uh, and expresses what the original autograph said. Now, that sounds like a lot of caveats, but it's really not. Because we can be very confident that what you have and what I have is indeed the Word of God. Okay, so when we look at Scripture, granted we're looking at translations, most everybody that can't read the original Hebrew and whatever, we're looking at Word of God, figuring out what's going on there, and, and it says, what it says is true to what it says. So yeah. what is the relevance of, relevance of that, or why is that important when we're dealing with science faith, science history type discussions? Well, and Fuzz will probably want to speak to this also, but there are a number of places in which the Bible makes claims about the nature of nature, what okay. the universe is like. Uh, it was created out of nothing. So we would expect then that the, bi uh, th that the universe would show evidences of having a beginning. And that is exactly what we see in the Big Bang hypothesis, for example. So this is the idea that what we see in Scripture and what we see in creation as we properly interpret, they ought to correspond to one another or have a congruence with one another. Yes, it, yes. Okay. Uh, we should, there is an expectation uh, that the God who created the heavens and the earth is the one who gave us the Bible. Uh, he has revealed himself in nature, mm -hmm. in that nature is both good and glorious, and these are expressions of his nature. And then he reveals to us uh, in his word uh, his relationship to the created order and what he is doing. So we expect those two to be in agreement. Right. I mean, the idea that God is creator, of course, is foundational mm -hmm. to the Christian faith. And the, the, the notion of God as creator is established in the creation accounts, which many instances read as if these are real events that God mm -hmm. uh, engaged in, that there's a real natural history there. So the expectation would be that not only should there be agreement, but that when that agreement is evident, that this becomes a very powerful platform to introduce people to the truthfulness of the Christian faith. That is, science can be a bridge to the credibility of Scripture and then in turn help people to see the credibility of the gospel. That, that seems to me a real powerful point that there are people who don't really necessarily believe what the Bible has to say, but by looking at what script or creation says, showing that there's this congruence between Scripture and creation, that's, that seems to be a pretty powerful tool. Uh, let's kind of poke and prod at one of those issues. I, I've heard a number of people say that, uh, you know, when you're looking at if evolution's true, you've got Adam and Eve, those are not real people, there's just thousands of people. Uh, Bible really doesn't need a historical Adam and Eve. 
how does, let's kind of, let's probe that for just a couple of minutes, because I think that's one that a lot of people are going to wrestle with if you deal with science faith issues. So what do we do with that? Well, Reasons to Believe uh, is an inerrantist organization. So mm -hmm. uh, we are starting from the perspective that what the Bible tells us is true. When we look at Genesis chapter 2, we have the account of a special creation by God of an original couple. And of course, this is Adam and Eve. So taking the Bible to be telling us the truth, we expect that this would be what the empirical evidence uh, verifies. Now, well, now, I mean, it is the case. I, I would agree with that assessment. But for a long time, the scientific evidence seems to be saying there isn't an Adam and Eve. So what do we do with that tension there? Well, and I think it's important to realize that almost all the data that's generated scientifically with regard to the question of human origins is within the context of the evolutionary paradigm, mm -hmm. where the assumption is that, that human beings must have evolved. But it's interesting to me that even in the context of that paradigm, there are, there's this data that just seems to be really provocative in light of the biblical story. Mm -hmm. So for the data being? For example, every person on the planet can trace an origin back to what many people think to be a single female individual using mitochondrial DNA as a marker. Every man can trace an origin back to what appears to be a single male individual, uh, again, with Y chromosomal DNA as the genetic marker. This is really provocative, in fact. Well, th that, those are the terms, aren't, don't they have that kind of connotation of Adam and Eve? In yeah, that, mitochondrial they? Eve, Y chromosome Adam. Now again, evolutionary biologists are viewing this in the context of an evolutionary framework, so they would reject the biblical account, but even it's interesting that if you separate that data from that framework, it does look like there's something there going on that suggests mm -hmm. maybe this biblical story is really true. And, and as an iner inerrantist, we don't say that there's never times of tension in which mm -hmm. there are yet unresolved questions. That's not surprising throughout the history of the church. Let's remember uh, for a significant time in, in the history of the church, the steady state model of the universe was the reigning scientific paradigm. Yeah. And that created tension uh, among, it, back in the early church, uh, the patristics up through the enlightenment, uh, another time in which uh, it seemed that the scientific consensus was the universe has always been here. Whereas the Bible clearly states mm -hmm. that it has a beginning. Now, uh, by the time we come to the latter part of the 20th century, science has changed its opinion. The Big Bang hypothesis uh, mm -hmm. is now the reigning paradigm. It fits very well uh, with what Genesis has to say. So there, there can be times of tension that are then resolved later. And if we don't have an answer to every question, and we certainly don't, we still can operate with confidence and by faith that they, they will be resol resolved eventually. You know, I, I think that's an incredibly powerful point, that it's not that we have all the answers right now, but history, scientific discovery, theological discoveries have shown that as we look at what God has revealed in creation, and as we look at what God's revealed in scripture, that they really have shown to be congruent. And that is a powerful tool. I would like to encourage you, we've got a, a resource, it's called Creation, Evolution, and Biblical Inerrancy. This resource will help equip you with some of those tools so that you can go out and share the gospel. Hey guys, I'm Monica Jones, and today I'm talking to Dr. Jeff Zwerink. And Jeff is RTB Senior Research Scholar. He is also an astrophysicist, been a Christian his whole life. He's a scientist, but not a Christian scientist. Um, so today I get to talk to him about this amazing student mentoring program here at Reasons to Believe called The Lab. So Jeff, what is The Lab? The Lab really is just a great opportunity for people who want to go into a science or STEM career to get together, hang out with other scientists who are Christians, other Christians who want to go into the sciences, and really just kind of ask questions like, is God really calling me into science? What do I do with the Big Bang? Just a chance to interact and hang out and be mentored by people who are in the fields to prepare them for the challenges they're going to face. So why do you think this is so important? I know that you, in your own testimony, has shared being a Christian and then loving science, you had to reconcile some things there. Um, so why, why is this so important? Well, 
really, when I look back, there were just a number of things that my dad did for me. He uh, encouraged me to find a mentor when I was away at college. Mm -hmm. He wrestled with some of these same issues that I did. I had somebody to interact with. And that mentoring that he did for me is really kind of what I want to extend to the students involved in the lab. Uh, there's just lots of questions, lots of challenges mm -hmm. that come up. And so finding a forum where these students who want to go into a scientific career, ultimately to equip them to be missionaries in those fields, mm -hmm. we thought, hey, this would be a great way to do this. And so we just want to be able to pour in what I've learned from those mentors I've had around me. That's awesome. You get to interact with scientists. We have fun things that we do while you're here. Parents can come and ask questions. It's just a really awesome thing to be a part of. So Jeff, thank you for talking to me about the lab. And if you guys want more information on the lab, visit our website, reasons.org, and you click on the little button that says education, then off to the right, there's the lab tab. Uh, I hope you check it out. It's really an amazing program. See you next time. Once again, we want to encourage you to check out the lab or send the college student in your life to reasons.org backslash the lab. Well, that about does it for us this week. Thanks for joining us on 2819. And, you know, we hope that um, this show will just really encourage you to have conversations with people in your life, to step out in faith, uh, share your faith, and do so with confidence and compassion. For sure. And we want to encourage people not just to watch the show, mm -hmm. but to take the tips that we're giving them in the show and really take that next step to sharing their faith and bringing the gospel to someone in your life. And you know, we do want to just remind you that this show was made possible through the faithful support of Reasons to Believe donors. So if you feel led to support resources like this, please visit reasons.org 2819. Until next time, be sure to check us out on the web at reasons.org. So many great resources for you to check out there or to share with your unbelieving friends. And we are also on social media. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show. We'll see, see you, you next week. week.